everyone and welcome back to our channel. We are picking up on an ongoing series wherein we cover the way a celebration or holiday or festivity has evolved over time, um, often starting as multiple different celebrations from various cultures that syncretized and blended together and became a holiday that we celebrate now. The first class series um, in this ongoing overall series that we did was back in October and it covered the evolution of Samhain and All Hallowtide into modern Halloween. This class series covers the evolution of Saturnalia, Sol Invictus, the January Calends of the Roman Empire, um, the early Christian celebrations around the Nativity story, and the Germanic celebrations of Yule and similar holidays in the Germanic area, and all the figures thereof and how they blended and syncretized together. This is the fourth class in the Saturnalia Yule Christmas series, and it is covering the early Christians and the Nativity story. We left off discussing um, basically how I witnessed a lot of neo-pagans and pantheistic reconstructionists citing how the Nativity story stole from a bunch of other cultures in ways that it cannot be proven that it did. Um, I'm not saying that some of the elements aren't borrowed, and I'm not saying that there wasn't a cultural influence upon the development of the nativity story from other cultures. I'm just saying that some of the ways I'm seeing it be said that this happened and demonstrated with what people are saying is proof, there isn't actually any proof of or it's, or it's being misconstrued. So that was last time. I'm just going to somewhere in here uh you can go check out that class it also covered the conversion of constantine to christianity and the proof of when the very first celebration of jesus christ's birth in rome was like when it was what proof there is um etc that was tortured i'm sorry ah, it's been a long holiday. As you can tell, I basically have no voice. And also, um, the heater is broken in our house, so it is very, very cold. I'm sitting next to a heater wearing sweaters. But anyway, so we're going to pick up with the early Christians and the Nativity story. The Christian New Testament says relatively little about Jesus' birth. It is generally acknowledged that of the various books eventually included in the New Testament, Paul's letters were written the earliest, and those letters say nothing specific about the birth of Jesus. Out of the 27 total books in the New Testament, or what we accept as the New Testament because there are several apocryphal books that are not included in the accepted New Testament, only four Gospels really go into the life of Jesus. They all touch on it, but four Gospels total tell us the most and go into the most detail. Only two of those four talk about the Nativity, and their accounts are quite brief, and they differ from each other quite significantly. Christians disagree about whether the Gospels were actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or by authors representing traditions that were associated with those people. So one of the theological theories, sorry, that was a little tortured, but what, one of the theories that you see in theology is that actually these books weren't written by those figures, but were written by the people who ascribed to the tradition started by each of those figures because they each vary a little bit in their approach to being one of the apostles and following the teachings of Christ. Anyway, moving right along. Mark's Gospel begins in the very first chapter with John the Baptist and John's baptism of Jesus, who by that time was already an adult, and it skips the birth of Jesus. John's Gospel begins with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
A few verses later, John writes, And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. There is nothing else about Jesus' birth in the Gospel of John. The two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, that do feature nativity stories, features ones that, as we said, are quite different from each other. So, Matthew and Luke's differing stories. According to Matthew's version of the nativity story, Mary was a Jewish girl engaged to a Jewish man named Joseph. She was told that she was to have a child from the Holy Spirit. As Joseph was not the baby's father, he feared public disgrace and decided to end the engagement. But before he could do so, he had a dream. In it, an angel told him to marry Mary, adopt the baby, and to name the baby Jesus. After Jesus was born, the wise men from the east followed a star westwards. They believed it would lead them to a new king of the Jews. In Jerusalem, the wise men met the Jewish king, Herod. He was portrayed as shocked, scared, and angry to hear their story. The wise men traveled to Bethlehem and they gave royal gifts to Jesus. After a dream that warned them not to go back to Herod, they left for home straight away. Furious that his reign would end and that he would be replaced, King Herod gave orders to kill all babies under two years old in Bethlehem. To save Jesus, Mary and Joseph fled with Jesus as refugees to Egypt. The Nativity Story According to Luke Mary was a young girl living in Nazareth. An angel appeared and told her she had found favor with God. By the power of God's Holy Spirit, she would have a son. Mary praised God and thanked him for choosing a lowly person for such an important task. The Roman Emperor Augustus ordered a census, a population count. For this, Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem. At Bethlehem, there was no room at the inn. Mary gave birth to a baby boy and laid him in a manger, a feeding place for cattle. The same night, an angel appeared to shepherds in fields outside of Bethlehem and announced that a savior, who is the Messiah, was born. More angels appeared, praising God and singing peace on earth among men with whom God is pleased. The shepherds hurried to see the baby Jesus. At eight days old, Jesus was taken to the Jewish temple at Jerusalem. When they saw him there, two elderly Jewish prophets praised God for sending a savior. Then Mary and Joseph took Jesus to Nazareth. So, do we know the time of year from this account? Nothing in the New Testament indicates the month or the day or the year of Jesus' birth. Luke's Gospel stated that the shepherds were living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. This is Luke 2.8. This doesn't narrow it down much, though, because shepherds in that region tended their flocks outside for at least three seasons of the year, excluding only winter. So by Luke's account, this excludes December. Many people assume that Jesus was born in the year 1 CE, with Jesus' birth as the dividing line between BCE and CE, which used to be called AD. Um, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but I tend to use CE, which means Common Era. That calendar system was developed by a monk, Dionysius Exigus, also called Dionysius the Short, who lived from circa 470 to circa 544 CE in Scythia Minor, which is probably modern Dobruja in Romania and Bulgaria, approximately 500 years after the lifetime of Jesus. So people are like, well, they started, they started labeling the years differently right away. Nope, didn't happen for another 500 years. That was when someone started dividing the calendar based on when Jesus was thought to have been born. Um, but that was not based on first-hand accounts or records that marked for sure Jesus' birthday. Okay. Is the nativity story true? Is there a chance either version is historically true. According to many Christians, the two nativity accounts are historically accurate and do not contradict each other. Their perspective is that, although there are differences in the accounts of the nativity in Luke and Matthew, a general narrative can be constructed 
by combining the two. So essentially, if you took them and wove them together, all the events are accurate. You just have to sort of say, okay, well, this biographer focused on these elements of the story and this biographer focused on these elements of the story. Paul Barnett, the Anglican Bishop of North Sydney, Australia, from 1990 to 2001, um, who has taught in Vancouver and in Australia, teaches that virtually all of the nativity story did happen literally in history. In his book, Is the New Testament Reliable?, which is also called by the title, Is the New Testament History?, Barnett says that it is reasonable to accept that, that the gospel stories are historically accurate. Quote, Matthew and Luke, though clearly independent of each other, agree on the major details of when and where it occurred, as well as the miraculous conception of the child. Moreover, many incidental details in the stories fit unobtrusively yet consistently into the known background of Jewish history. Many modern historical scholars consider the birth narratives unhistorical because they are laced with theology and present two very different accounts. There are problems with the events described as well, such as Luke's census, for which everyone returned to their ancestral home. This is not historically credible, and it's also not in the Roman records at the time, and they did keep records of the various edicts that went out. The whole thing, sending everybody home for the census, is contrary to Roman practice. They would not have uprooted everyone from their homes and farms in the empire by forcing them to return to their ancestral cities. Moreover, people would not have been able to trace their own lineages back 42 generations, which is what the text says that they, they had to do like that. That really isn't a thing that the Roman Empire would have demanded of people. There is no mention anywhere in the historical record, apart from Matthew's Gospel, of Herod's mass murder of infants either. It would be extremely unlikely that such a major tragedy would completely disappear from the historical record. We have writings from this time period. People were writing things down. You would think that something like that would have made it into the historical record somehow, somewhere, and it didn't. Herod was a murderer, though. Um, he married ten wives, all who plotted behind his back to get power for their sons. Um, he had his second wife, her mother, and his brother-in-law killed as he felt that they were dangerous rivals. So this was in character for him. He was definitely a murderer who was willing to murder to keep power. And something like that, this king is a murderer. He's willing to murder to keep himself in power. That can evolve. Um, and grow as a story, which is what some historians think happened, that because he was a murderer, that got reinterpreted through the lens of this narrative. Robert J. Miller, who teaches religious studies at Yuan Miata College in Pennsylvania, studied the nativity and early life of Jesus narratives in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, along with other historical evidence, and came to the conclusion that Quote, we are left with little reason to think that Luke and Matthew recorded actual history. Rather, we have strong reasons to think that they freely created their stories in order to express theological and not historical truth. He also claims that assessment would not have been alarming, nor even especially interesting to the gospel's original readers. For them, the truth of this kind of story did not depend on its historicity. This historical perspective, which is held by other biblical scholars as well, is based on the fact that Jesus often told parables without his followers debating whether or not they were true. They were instead focused on the lesson to be learned from the tale. In the same way, um, Miller says that the early Christians, quote, did not intend them to be historical accounts, nor did their audiences expect it, end quote. The late Raymond Brown, who lived from May 22, 1928 to August 8, 1998, a Roman Catholic priest recognized by both Protestants and Catholics as a preeminent New Testament scholar, wrote a well-regarded commentary on the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke called The Birth of the Messiah. He wrote, quote, I think an intelligent case can be made for the historicity of some of the details in the infancy narratives that have a close relationship to Christian doctrine. However, 
Brown went on to clarify that, quote, close analysis of the infancy narratives makes it unlikely that either account is completely historical, end quote. Brown felt that there were contradictions between the two Gospels, not just differences in detail, and he concluded that certain details, such as the census that supposedly brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, conflict with external evidence. He noted that Herod's massacre of male children at Bethlehem in an attempt to kill Jesus sounds very much like Pharaoh's order to slaughter the children of the Israelites in an attempt to kill Moses, and that similarly, the descriptions of the parents of John the Baptist are copied almost verbatim from descriptions of Abraham and Sarah in the Hebrew accounts. Because the parallels are so close, Brown found the narratives, quote, implausible as history, end quote, but meaningful as a transition from the Hebrew religion to the evolving Christian religion. So basically his theory is that this was an evolving religion that started off as a branch out of the Hebrew faith. And so they took elements that would have been very familiar to the Hebrew religion and evolved those into a new Christian narrative. So when we talk about the Christ story, the, the infancy and the nativity of Christ as borrowing from earlier religions, the one that we fail to talk about the most is the Hebrew one, um, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more as we go. But in the last class, we talked about how everyone wants to compare it to these other deities from these other religions, but the Hebrew had their own faith that Christianity evolved out of. And if you want to look to where they borrowed elements from, it's quite clear that they borrowed elements from the accepted Hebrew faith, which then evolved. Moving right along, the Muslim nativity story. The Muslim holy book, the Quran, also has a version of the story of Christ's birth. As in the gospel version, an angel appears to Maryam, which is Mary, uh, with a message from Allah, God. She will receive the, quote, gift of a holy son, end quote. Like Mary in the Gospel, Maryam also gives birth away from home and safety, this time under a palm tree. At first, Maryam's family is shocked, but the baby, Isa, which is Jesus, rebukes them, saying, quote, I am indeed a servant of Allah. He hath given me revelation and made me a prophet, end quote. The Quran does not include the wise men as part of the nativity story. However, the Persian Muslim encyclopedist al-Tabari, who lived from 839 CE to 923 CE, um, who wrote in the 9th century, gives the familiar symbolism of the gifts of the Magi as part of his narrative. Al-Tabari cited his source for the information as the 7th century Perso-Yemenite writer Wab ibn Munabi. I am probably horribly slaughtering that. I'm sorry, I'm going to put it in the text below, who lived from 655 CE to 738 CE. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, I s had to stop recording and then go teach our Patreon exclusive Practical Magic live class on our Discord. And um, then I felt really unwell and I had to go lay down. So wardrobe change, we've jumped ahead to the next day and I'm going to continue filming the class series. Um, and we will pick back up where we left off, which is actually at the discussion of the three Magi. So we've detailed that Matthew's nativity account described wise men from the East. And most of our viewers have probably heard the song, um, We Three Kings of Orient Are. I don't actually know the title of that song, but that's the line that you've probably heard from it. It's just called We Three Kings. Is it really? Mm -hmm. Okay, so We Three Kings. So you've probably heard the song, We Three Kings. From around 500 CE onward, Christian artists portrayed three richly dressed kings offering gifts to the newborn baby Jesus. 
Jewish people living at the time of Jesus um, hoped for a Messiah in order to free them from Roman rule and to set up a kingdom where they would be safe. Jewish prophecies said that kings would come to worship the Messiah, bringing royal gifts. Isaiah 60, 1 through 6, which refers to kings coming to the brightness of your dawn, bearing gold and frankincense, and Psalm 72, 10 through 11, which is actually probably about King Solomon. May the kings of Tarshish and of the Isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations give him service. Early Christians linked the story of the wise men coming to bring gifts to the baby Jesus to the old Jewish prophecies and thought that the wise men that the narrative referred to must be kings bowing down to the new king. At first, these early Christians spoke of two visitors or 12 or four but then they came to link the number of gifts with the number of givers. There were three gifts, so there must have been three royal visitors, they said. By around 500 CE, they had even given them names, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, although their names in Armenia and Egypt are different. By 700 CE, each king also had a new identity, Caspar was always portrayed as young, and from the Mediterranean, or maybe from Europe, Melchior was portrayed as old, and from um, sort of the Arab regions or Asia, and Balthazar was always portrayed as middle-aged and African. Traditional nativity scenes depict the wise men visiting the infant Jesus on the night of his birth, in a manger accompanied by the shepherds and the angels, but this should be understood as a bit of an artistic convention for ease because it combines two separate scenes from the narratives of the nativity, the adoration of the shepherds on the birth night and the later adoration of the magi. The single biblical account in the Gospel of Matthew only states that at an unspecified point after Christ's birth, an unnumbered party of unnamed wise men um, which are used, they're described using the word magoi, visit him in his house, not in a manger, and um, only his mother is mentioned as being present. The text gives no stated interval between the birth and the visit by the wise men, either short or long. Um, some theologians think that it was on December 25th and some think that it was on January 6th, while other theologians think that the visit occurred as late as two winters later, so like maximum interval two years. This maximum interval is explained by Herod's command in Matthew 2, 16 through 18, that the massacre of the innocents include boys up to two years old. Okay, so there's, Various names that these figures are called. They're called the three wise men, they're called the three kings, they're called the three magi. Which would be the most accurate? At the time of Matthew's gospel, the magi would have been well known. The word magi is the plural of the Latin word magus, borrowed from the Greek magos. It is the word used in the original Greek text of the Gospel of Matthew, in the plural, magoi. The Greek magus itself derived from the old Persian word for magus, the avestan maguano. The term refers to the Persian priestly caste that is found within Zoroastrianism, which is incidentally the religious caste into which Zoroaster was born. Yasna 33.7 translates into English as, So I can be heard beyond Magi. As part of their religion, the Magi studied and gained a well-renowned and internationally, like, well-known reputation for astrology, which was at the time considered an important 
science. It wasn't really associated with the occult. It, it was considered a, a branch of science. The King James Version translates the term as wise men. The same translation is applied to the wise men led by Daniel of earlier Hebrew scriptures, Daniel 2, 48. But the same word in the King James Version is translated as sorcerer and sorcery when describing El Yamas the sorcerer in Acts 13, 6 through 11, and Simon Magus, who was considered a heretic by the early church, in Acts 8, 9 through 13. So as always, we can see that the people who translated the text translated one word however they saw fit to suit the narrative that they were pushing. Um, now you could say that all of these translations are an aspect of what it means to be a magi, that you are both an astrologer and a sorcerer and a wise person if you are a magus. And that wouldn't necessarily be inaccurate, but it is interesting to note how one word can be translated so many different ways within the same text. Moving right along. Several translations use the term as astrologer. Uh, rather than wise men, including the New English Bible from 1961, the Phillips New Testament in Modern English um, from 1972, the 20th Century New Testament, the 1904 Revised Edition, the Amplified Bible, 1958, an American Translation, 1935, and the Living Bible, 1962. So astrologer is a common way that this particular word, magi, is, is translated in biblical accounts. Some early Christian stories told how these figures each lived to be over a hundred years, traveled to India, and died in Armenia. Marco Polo, who lived from 1254 CE to January 8 or 9, 1324 CE, a Venetian merchant, explorer, and writer who traveled through Asia along the Silk Road between 1271 CE and 1295 CE, claimed that he was actually shown the three tombs of the Magi at Save, south of Tehran in the 1270s. Quote, in Persia is the city of Sabah, from which the three Magi set out when they went to worship Jesus Christ and in this city they are buried, in three very large and beautiful monuments side by side. And above them there is a square building, carefully kept. The bodies are still entire, with their hair and beards remaining. Marco Polo, The Book of the Million, Book 1, Chapter 13. Another tale that is very popular says the bodies of the three were actually discovered by St. Helena, Fully Flavia Julia Helena, circa 246 to 248 CE to circa 330 CE, who is actually the mother of the first Christian emperor, Constantine, who we've discussed so much in this series, during her pilgrimage to the Holy Land. According to this version of the story, which actually then has a couple different versions itself, the Magi returned to Jerusalem 30 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, where they subsequently died as martyrs in the span of a couple days around the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th. One version of the legend says that the Star of Bethlehem reappeared to the Magi and called them to regather on the spot where they had previously departed from each other on their journey home after giving the gifts to honor the birth of Jesus Christ. So, this is where you start seeing different versions of this one particular tale, because there are two versions that disagree on whether or not the Magi were buried in the same tomb or three different tombs, but all state that they were buried in Bethlehem. Approximately two centuries later, St. Helena went to the Holy Land on pilgrimage, 326 to 328 CE. While she was there, she is claimed to have uncovered the locations and relics of numerous biblical events. 
Her trip to Jerusalem is actually documented as a historical event. She did actually go, but many additional legends quickly became associated with the Empress and the Empress's visit to the Holy Land, including the discovery of the bodies of the Magi, but also the discovery of a lot of other things. Helena is said to have transferred the relics to the Church of St. Sophia in Constantinople, which I can't say without a song playing in my head. And then when St. Eustorgio, um, unknown birth date to around 349 CE, the first Bishop of Milan from 344 to 350 CE was in Constantinople to be installed as the Bishop of Milan, the Emperor Constantine gave him the bodies of the Magi. While still in Constantinople, Ustorgio is said to have carved a marble ark or sarcophagus for the relics. He then sailed back to Italy with the relics and landed on the coast, where he drove them in an ox-drawn cart towards Milan. Near the Tysonese Gate, Tychonese Gate? Tysonese Gate? I don't know. The heavy cart was said to have become stuck in the mud and not be able to proceed any further. So right there, the bishop ordered a church to be built for the relics of the Magi, basically on the location where they had become stuck. This location is now presumed to be the Basilica de Sant Ustoporio. In the 1160 CE, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of Germany sacked the city of Milan and rewarded the relics of the Magi, which were housed in the Basilica di San Ustorgio in Milan, to the Archbishop of Cologne, Reynald von Dassel, as a reward for providing the Emperor with an army. Reynald von Dassel placed the bones in a cathedral in Cologne, Germany, where a huge and magnificent shrine of pure gold and glittering precious stones was made to contain them. The shrine took 90 years to make, and then a whole new cathedral was built to shelter the shrine and to give shelter to any visiting pilgrims that wanted to see the relics. The new cathedral became the largest medieval church in all of Europe. Even though the three kings or three magi or three wise men's bones were imprisoned in gold, Christian legends started telling how they would make a miraculous journey to Bethlehem each Christmas time. Traditionally, children in Spain and in the south of France learn that if they're good, the three figures will call as they pass by and bring them presents on the 5th of January, which is sometimes called Epiphany Eve. In modern times, the relics of the Magi are in both Cologne and Milan, as a portion of the relics were returned to Milan and restored to the Basilica di Sant Ustorgio on Epiphany, January 6th, 1904. Whew, that's a lot of information, but there's a, a major part of this story that's always interested me, because it's kind of like how everyone always pictures the Monopoly person as wearing a monocle, but he doesn't wear a monocle. The Magi are always said, well, if not always, then often, very often said, to have followed a bright star. But the Gospel of Matthew doesn't say that the star was bright. It does say that they followed a star, but according to Matthew, the Magi observed the star at its rising and found Jesus when the star stopped. This is far more accurate to astronomy of the time rather than following one significantly bright star. But tales evolve over time. Brightness is featured in the description of the star in the Proto-Evangelion of James, which is a second century gospel that is considered apocryphal and so is not included in the Bible. Um, there's a lot of books that, that didn't get included in the Bible. In that version of the story, the Magi said to Herod, we saw a star in the sky that was so brilliant that it dimmed the other stars to the point where they were no longer visible, James 21, 8. 
there were astronomers in other countries at the time of the narrative around the nativity, everywhere from Babylon to India to China, and many of them kept really careful records of their observances of the stars, yet none of their observations record a new bright star shining in the western sky around 4 BC, and not even in the years around 4 BC. According to some theories, it wasn't actually a star, but rather what the Magi saw were two planets, Saturn and Jupiter, shining close together in 7 or 6 BCE, which of course changes all the timing. So, I just mentioned Epiphany several times. So what's Epiphany? The word Epiphany comes from the Greek epiphania, meaning manifestation or appearance, which is derived from the verb phenian, meaning to appear. In classical Greek, it was used for the appearance of the dawn, of an enemy in war, but especially to describe the manifestation of a deity to a worshiper, which is also referred to as a theophany. In the hate pronouncing this, I'm going to do my best. In the Septuagint, the word is used to describe the manifestation of the God of Israel to Maccabees 15.27. In the New Testament, the word is used to refer equally to the birth of Christ or to his appearance after his resurrection, and five times to refer to his second coming. In this context, Epiphany refers to how Jesus was revealed or made manifest to the world as the Son of God. Some consider the Epiphany to be the birth of Jesus, with the signs and wonders to mark his coming, and some consider it to be at the baptism of Jesus, because this is when some gospels say that a dove or the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descended on Jesus and a voice proclaimed Jesus to be God's son to the world. Some say the epiphany was the appearance of the Magi because their recognition of the child as divine led to the world's recognition of his divinity. Other theologians say that all of these are part of the epiphany or each a smaller epiphany of their own, including even the turning of the water into wine at the wedding in Cana, because that was the first of Jesus' public miracles, according to the Gospel of John, and the feeding of the 5,000, as it was the first very large and public miracle. All of these have been recognized as part of the epiphany celebrations at one time or another. Before the celebration of Christ's birth was common, following what we've already documented shortly before Constantine's death or right around Constantine's death, Rome was effectively split in half. The eastern side consisted of the Mediterranean, extending from Egypt through Palestine up to what we now call Syria, Turkey, and Greece. Although technically part of Rome, the eastern part of the empire consisted mostly of the conquered Greeks. Greek was still the common language of the area. The western side of the Roman Empire, which used Latin as the common language, encompassed both northern Africa and southern Europe, including Italy. This was not just a linguistic divide or a geographical divide, but a cultural fissure as well. The Greek portion of the empire considered itself intellectually and culturally superior, while the Roman portion of the empire considered itself more modern and, um, very importantly, more militarily strong. When Christianity spread throughout the Mediterranean, Christianity also developed cultural divisions along these same cultural dividing lines, including variations on standard religious practices and theology. This persists to modern times. The eastern side of the empire are predominantly Orthodox Christians, and the heirs of the Western side are both Roman Catholics and Protestants. This divide between East and West is still visible in the recognition of Epiphany. In Western Christianity, the Feast of Epiphany commemorates principally, but not solely, the visit of the Magi to the Christ child, and thus Jesus' physical manifestation to the Gentiles. It is sometimes called Three Kings Day, and in some traditions celebrated as Little Christmas. 
Moreover, the Feast of the Epiphany in some denominations also initiates the liturgical season of Epiphany Tide. Eastern Christians, on the other hand, commemorate the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, seen as his manifestation to the world as the Son of God. The spot marked by Qasr el Yahud in the West Bank and al Maktas in Jordan on the East Bank is considered to be the original site of the baptism of Jesus and the ministry of John the Baptist. Even the date is divided. The traditional date for the feast is January 6th. The Eastern churches, which are still following the Julian calendar, observe the feast on what, according to the internationally used Gregorian calendar, is January 19th because of the current 13-day difference between the Julian and Gregorian calendars. The earliest celebrations of Epiphany may have arisen in the Eastern Roman Empire, though this is debated and there isn't enough historical evidence to prove it one way or another. The earliest record of what might be considered Epiphany festivities comes from the aforementioned Clement of Alexandria, fully Titus Flavius Clemens, circa 150 CE to circa 215 CE, a Christian theologian and philosopher who taught at the catechetical school of Alexandria. This was before the recording of celebrations of Christ's birth in Rome. Clement of Alexandria wrote, quote, but the followers of the early Christian Gnostic religious teacher, Basilides, celebrate the day of his baptism too, spending the previous night in readings. And they say that it was the 15th of the month to be on the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And some say that it was observed the 11th of the same month. The Egyptian dates given correspond to January 6th and January 10th. The Basilides were a Gnostic sect that saw themselves as Christians, though they were eventually considered heretics by the majority of the Christian church. By readings, Clement likely meant that the facilities were reading the gospels. In ancient gospel manuscripts, the text is arranged to indicate passages for liturgical readings. If a congregation began reading Mark at the beginning of the year, it might arrive at the story of the baptism on January 6th, thus explaining the date of the feast. So the Epiphany festivities might not be because that was when the Epiphany is thought to have taken place in actuality, but simply when the readers got there in the text. We do not know if other Christians in that region also observed the same festivities. If Christians read Mark in the same format the facilities did, the two groups could have arrived at the January 6th date independently of one another. But we do know that by sometime in the 300 CE, Epiphany was celebrated in the eastern portion of the empire on January 6th by the majority of the Eastern Christians. At that time, however, the Epiphany was focused more on the birth of Jesus and the signs of the coming of his birth. When the Christians of the Western Roman Empire eventually started to recognize December 25th as Jesus' birth date, they met resistance from some Eastern Christians who complained that they already had a commemoration of Jesus' birth and that it was on January. 6th. The earliest reference to Epiphany as a Christian feast, a feast day, was in 361 CE by Ammianus Marcellinus, who lived from circa 330 CE to circa 391 to 400 CE, a Roman soldier and historian who wrote the penultimate major historical account that survives from Roman antiquity, preceding Prosopius. His work, known as the Res Gestae, chronicled in Latin the history of Rome from the ascension of the Emperor Nerva to, in 96 to the death of Valens at the Battle of Andrianople, I think I said that right, in 378, although only the sections covering the period from 353 to 378 CE survive to the modern day. He wrote about the celebration feast and listed it as occurring twice, which suggests a double feast, one for the baptism and one for the birth. The baptism of Jesus was originally assigned to the same date as the birth date of Jesus because Luke 3.23 was misread as claiming that Jesus was exactly 
30 when he was baptized, as in that he was baptized on his birthday 30 years later. Epiphanius of Salamis, who lived from circa 310 to 320 CE to 403 CE, the Bishop of Salamis, Cyprus at the end of the fourth century, said that January 6th was Christ's birthday, that is, his epiphany. He also asserted that the miracle at Cana occurred on the same calendar day, but that the baptism did not occur until November 6th when Christ was 30. Some modern historians believe that the Eastern Christians developed an Epiphany celebration in order to compete with an Egyptian winter solstice celebration that occurred on January 6th. More recent scholarship by liturgical historian Thomas Taley, author of The Origins of the Liturgical Year, has raised questions about whether there really was an ancient pre-existing Egyptian solstice festival on that date. Yet whether it was a solstice festival or something else entirely, the pre-Christian Egyptians did have some sort of celebration on January 6th. The aforementioned Epiphanius of Salamis spent time as a youth in Egyptian monasteries. He claimed that at Alexandria on January 6th, the Egyptians celebrated the birth of Aeon, a Hellenistic deity associated with time. Um, the orb or circle encompassing the universe and the zodiac. The time represented by Aeon is unbounded, in contrast to Kronos, which is more empirical time divided into past, present, and future. Aeon is associated with the mystery religions concerned with the afterlife, such as the mysteries of Sibyl, Dionysus, Orpheus, and Mithras. So... Epiphanius claimed that the Egyptians who were celebrating the birth of Aeon were celebrating the birth of Aeon as being birthed from the virgin goddess Kore. During the ceremony, a wood statue of Aeon marked with gold inlaid crosses on his hands, knees, and forehead was brought up from an underground vault. It was carried in a procession through the temple, which included many lit torches, and then a grand feast would follow, along with an all-night vigil, after which the icon was returned to the vault. Epiphanius stated that the celebration coincided with Aeon's birth. On this day and at this hour, Corey gave birth to Aeon. An inscription from Eleusius also identifies Aeon as the son of Corey. Epiphanius also reported an Egyptian belief that on January 5th or 6th, water from the Nile turned into wine. So how much this influenced the understanding of Epiphany, the, the, um, the practice of Epiphany feasts, we don't know for sure. Whether some details were appropriated or a lot of details were appropriated, it definitely syncretized a little bit in there, I think. I think, as a historian. The Alexandrian Aeon may have been a form of Osiris Dionysus, who is reborn annually. Gilles Quispel, who lived from 30th of May 1916 to the 2nd of March 2006, a Dutch theologian and historian of Christianity and Gnosticism, conjectured that the figure resulted from integrating the Orphic Phanus, who, like Aeon, is associated with a coiling serpent into the Mithraic religion at Alexandria and that he assured the eternity of the city. So in Egypt was the development of the special Christian day of Epiphany an attempt to co-opt or replace a festival that was already in place, as Aeon is a syncretic deity already that comes from multiple blended cultures, was this worship unique to the area or was it inspired by an even earlier Egyptian celebration? Did the Christian and Egyptian religious practices influence one another and create this unique Aeon? Like, so the narrative is that the Christians appropriated from this to create Epiphany, but it's entirely possible that the Egyptians appropriated some elements of the Christian narrative and turned that into this celebration. Um, there's not enough historical documentation to know who influenced whom, um, but there's definitely some common elements there. 
the aforementioned Philokalian calendar contained no mention of Epiphany. In 567 CE, the Council of Taurus proclaimed that the entire period between Christmas and Epiphany should be considered part of the celebration, creating what became known as the 12 Days of Christmas, or what the English call Christmastide. On the last of the 12 days, called Twelfth Night, as well as Epiphany Eve, various cultures developed a wide range of varying additional special festivities. Epiphany was also called Twelfth Day, which is not to be confused with Twelfth Night or Epiphany Eve. However, the variation we've noted extended even to how the days are counted. If Christmas Day is the first of the 12 days, then Twelfth Night would be on January 5th, the Eve of Epiphany, Epiphany Eve. If December 26th, the day after Christmas, is the first day, then Twelfth Night falls on January 6th, the evening of Epiphany itself. Um, this is actually a matter of debate in Christianity with various people practicing one or the other. Most modern people now celebrate Epiphany on January 6th and treat Epiphany Eve as the end of the 12 days of Christmas. So they treat the evening of January 5th as 12th night, Epiphany Eve, and the next day, January 6th, as Epiphany and the official end of the Christmas season. There is a superstition associated with this particular ma mapping out of the calendar days that this is the day to take down all decorations for the holidays and that those who fail to do so would be cursed with the bad luck in the next year. Like, if you didn't take down your decorations on, on Epiphany, then you would have bad luck for the rest of the year. Special church plays took place on Epiphany beginning in the Middle Ages. This was known as the Feast of the Star, and they reenacted the moment when the Magi arrived bearing their gifts. Three priests dressed as the Magi would enter the church and act as though they were following the star to Jesus. The star had a physical stand-in that was recorded in the accounts from Yarmouth written during the last half of the 15th century. This star was often mechanical, being moved by ropes and pulleys so that it would appear to travel down the church and lead the three magi to the high altar. A curtain would be drawn back to reveal a real child in a crib. The, tree, the three magi would worship and give presents. And then finally, a boy dressed as an angel would appear and conclude the ceremony by saying that the prophecies had been fulfilled. Though Epiphany was commonly perceived as the end of Christmastide, there were those who argued that the actual end of the season came nearly a month later, on the 2nd of February, on Candlemas. Candlemas was an important Christian feast day that also syncretized with non-Christian celebrations. However, we will get into that one in the spring. <laughs> oh, last chunk of today's class, Advent. After Christmas and Epiphany were in place on December 25th and January 6th, with the 12 days of Christmas in between, Christians also gradually added a period called Advent. Advent meant coming in Latin. Advent is the period of four Sundays and weeks before Christmas, or in some modern versions, it begins November 30th or the 1st of December and goes to Christmas Day. For today's Catholics and Protestants, Advent begins on the Sunday closest to November 30th, and it extends up to and including the day before Christmas. That means that Advent may last from 22 to 28 days, but it always includes four Sundays. For Eastern Orthodox Christians, Advent is even longer, starting on November 15th. According to these calendars, Advent only starts on the 1st of December when Christmas Day is on a Wednesday, which happened in 2019. Advent is the beginning of the liturgical year in Western Christianity. It is a period of spiritual reflection that prepares the person to celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world. There are three kinds of Jesus' coming that Christians celebrate and reflect upon during Advent. The first was Jesus' birth. The second is supposed to be allowing Jesus to enter the life of themselves as, as Christians take Jesus into their hearts and 
accept him into their lives. This is the, the coming of Jesus into their spirit. And the third is said to happen in the future, at an unknown time when Jesus is predicted to come back to the world as king and judge. Similar to how Lent developed among Christians as a period of fasting and repentance in preparation for Easter, Advent became a parallel time of preparing for Christmas. The Eastern Orthodox even sometimes refer to Advent as Little Lent or Christmas Lent. One common element of the Advent celebration is a wreath, a circle of evergreen branches that holds the Advent calendars, which mimics other midwinter festivities that predate Advent. We'll get into a little bit more detail on that in a minute. It is not documented in the historical record when exactly Advent began. It was in existence in some areas from about 480 CE onward. It was introduced by the Council of Tours of 567 CE that the monks should fast every day in the month of December until Christmas, but it is impossible to claim with any confidence that this was the absolutely certain origin of Advent. According to St. Gregory of Tours, 30th of November circa 538 to the 17th of November 594 CE, a Gallo-Roman historian and Bishop of Tours, the celebration of Advent began in the 5th century when the Bishop Perpetus, um, unknown birthday to December 30th, 490 CE, the 6th Bishop of Tours from 460 to 490 CE, directed that starting with St. Martin's Day on the 11th of November until Christmas, one should fast three times a week. This is why Advent was sometimes also named the Lent of St. Martin. This practice remained limited to the Diocese of Tours until the 6th century. The Macon Council held in 581 CE adopted the practice started in Tours and soon all of France observed three days of fasting a week from the Feast of St. Martin until Christmas. In some countries, very devout worshippers exceeded the requirements adopted by the Council of Macon and fasted every single day of Advent. The homilies of Gregory the Great, written in the late 16th century, depict four weeks to the liturgical season of Advent, but do not say if there is an observance of a fast. However, under Charlemagne, in the 9th century, writings claimed that the fasting was still widely observed. In the 13th century, the fast of Advent was not commonly practiced, although according to Durand of Mende, also called Guillaume Durand or William Durand, Durandus, Duranti, or Durantis, who lived from circa 1230 to November 1st, 1296 CE, a French canonist and liturgical writer, fasting was still generally observed. The Bull of Canonization of St. Louis said that the zeal with which he observed the Advent fast was no longer a custom observed by Christians of great piety. It became common following this period to limit the fasting to occurring from the Feast of St. Andrew until Christmas Day, since the solemnity of this apostle was more universal than that of St. Martin. When Pope Urban the who lived from 1319 CE to the 19th of December 1370 CE, ascended the papal seat in 1362, he required the people of his court to practice abstinence during Advent, but not fasting. Yeah, no sex, but you can eat. After Pope Urban became Pope, it was customary in Rome to observe five weeks of Advent before Christmas, which is described in the Sacramentary of St. Gregory. The Ambrosian or Milan liturgical calendar had a full six weeks of Advent. The liturgy of Advent remained unchanged until the Second Vatican Council introduced minor changes, differentiating the spirit of Lent from that of Advent, emphasizing Advent as a season of hope for Christ's coming and a promise of his second coming, that he would come again. In medieval and pre-medieval times in parts of England, there was an early form of nativity scenes that were called advent images, also called a vessel cup. 
Advent images consisted of a box, often with a glass lid that was covered with a white cloth that contained two dolls that represented Mary and the baby Jesus. The Advent box was decorated with ribbons and flowers and also sometimes apples, and they were carried around from door to door. It was thought to be very unlucky if a person had not seen an Advent box before Christmas Eve, so people paid the box carriers a half penny to see the box. Today, Orthodox Christians often don't eat meat or dairy during Advent, and depending on the day, sometimes they will not eat olive oil, wine, and fish. There are some songs that are considered Christmas carols that are actually Advent carols. These include People Look East, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, and um, probably the most popular and easily recognizable one, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. So, whether or not you actually belong to any of the sects in which Advent looks like what we've described, at some point or another, you've probably at least seen an Advent calendar. In the 19th century, German Protestant Christians counted down the Advent season by marking 24 chalk lines on a door and rubbing one off every day in December. Some families hung up little holy pictures, commissioned art, day by day. So they would literally have this stack of pictures that they had commissioned from an artist, and every day they would hang up one. In 1851 in Germany, advent calendars were invented as cut and painted more mass-produced pictures rather than the hand-painted art used by some families. By approximately 1903 CE, less expensive color printing made it possible to mass produce advent calendars, and they became very popular. Many featured scenes from the Christmas story and other Christmas images were used such as snowmen and robins. During World War II, the production of the advent calendars actually stopped due to a shortage of cardboard. The first calendar with chocolate in it was made in 1958, although they only became really popular in the 1980s. The very first advent calendar I ever saw was in Trader Joe's and had chocolate in it. <laughs> Grandma wouldn't let me have it because we didn't practice advents. Some European countries such as Germany use a wreath of fur with 24 bags or boxes hanging from the wreath. In each box or bag, there is a little present for each day. Okay, almost done. Advent candles. There are three types of candles that are used to count down the days of Advent. The first looks like a normal candle, but also has the days up to Christmas Day marked down the outside of the candle. On the 1st of December, the candle is lit and burnt down to the first line on the candle and then blown out. This is done every day until Christmas Day. One reason to use this form is because it's kind of meditative. You sit there while the candle burns down to the first line and think about the coming of Jesus. From the 1700s onwards, Lutheran churches in Scandinavia used 24 little candles to count down the day. Some families still do this in their homes, so like the chime candle size, and you would use 24 of them. The third kind is called an advent crown, which are often used in churches rather than in people's homes. The crown is a wreath of greenery, which has four candles around the outside and one in the middle or in a separate place. Sometimes there is no greenery and a more traditional candelabra is used to display the five candles. This is where I said I would come back to this. One candle is lit on the first Sunday of Advent. Two are lit on the second Sunday and so on. Each candle has a different meaning in Christianity and the meaning varies by sect of Christianity. Whew, okay, so we got through all of that. Next time, we are actually going to pick up on Yule and the Germanic traditions and how one of my favorite figures from mythology, Perkta, comes into all of this. Thank you for tuning in. If you haven't done so already, please remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel and maybe consider becoming a patron because patrons do gain access to exclusive content, including all of the notes that I'm reading off from which uh, may or may not be helpful to you, but they are being sent out to all of our patrons as I complete editing on them. Anyway, 
Whenever you celebrate this holiday season, whether you're counting down the days of Advent, whether you're celebrating the 12 days of Christmas, which we actually have more content on, um, I'm, I'm only on page uh, 39 of 250 pages of notes. I don't think I'm actually going to get through all of this series before the 25th, but I am certainly going to try. But um, whatever you're celebrating right now, if you're looking forward to the solstice on the 21st, whatever, I hope that you have a good one. And um, be safe out there, everyone. Constantinople, not Constantinople, Istanbul, Constantinople, so for you the date of Constantinople, she'll be waiting in Istanbul. Even for New York. <laughs> was once New Amsterdam. Why they changed it, I can't say. People just liked it better that way. And on that note... <laughs>